This is Yang'an, a sacred place for Chinese revolution located in northwest China's Shanxi province. It was here the forefathers of Chinese revolutionary refined their skills as a party of revolution, but also learned how to govern, how to win the support of the people. I'm here to follow the footsteps of a group of Taiwanese youths who are particularly curious about that period of history and who are here to find out what can be learned, what can be useful for the peaceful development of cross-strait relations. In fact, we have been working on anti-independence and pro-unification efforts in Taiwan because the current situation in Taiwan is indeed influenced by many factors, including U.S. intervention and the impact of the so-called desinization in Taiwan for the past 30 years since I was born. We have been advocating that the cross-straits confrontation is a historical issue for our fellow compatriots in Taiwan. We should sit down and have a good talk with our fellow Chinese on both sides of the straits to achieve peaceful reunification and solve the historical problems of the past decades so that our generation will no longer be troubled by it. In the past, we have been working on related efforts in Taiwan, which I wouldn't necessarily call a revolution, but it's certainly been done under a lot of pressure. We want to create more favorable conditions so that more compatriots can understand. I want to say that today, I came here to Shanxi to pay tribute to the Yellow Emperor. Nearby is where the early pioneers of the Chinese Revolution were located. We know that this was a sacred land of revolution. The important origin of the Yan'an spirit of the Communist Party of China was here. This is my first time in Yan'an, and being here in person is quite different from reading about it in books. The biggest shock was traveling from Xi'an to Huangling County and then to Yan'an. Nowadays, transportation is so developed that it took us four to five hours by car, and many of our friends felt dizzy and sleepy. It's hard to imagine how they managed to march from Jiangxi to Guizhou and finally arrive in Yan'an without highways and cars. They had to walk step by step, and I still find it hard to imagine to this day. I think what we often say is true. Ideas give rise to beliefs, and beliefs give rise to power. Many times people have a belief or a strong conviction that can inspire and drive them forward. It's like Taiwan, where we also feel that having a strong belief can give us the courage to speak out. My faith is to be a proud and honorable Chinese especially because, for 120 years of history, Taiwan was ceded to Japan due to the defeat in the First Sino-Japanese War, or Jiawu War, and later the Chinese Civil War. Chinese identity is something that I feel strongly about, especially living in Taiwan. Having experienced internal and external struggles on the island, being a proud and honorable Chinese is something that I value and consider to be my faith. Because Taiwan is far away from the mainland and separated by the Taiwan Straits, and due to the historical conflicts, many people feel a sense of detachment. Therefore, I hope that our generation can rebuild this sense of identity and connection. It's something that I have always hoped to establish in our generation. As we learned about modern Chinese history since childhood, we may wonder how a nation with a 5,000-year-old culture could have suffered so much humiliation and turmoil in the past 200 years. It's hard to imagine. I read about how the Chinese Civil War between the Kuomintang and the Communist Party led to the current standoff between Taiwan and the mainland. 
I felt that our generation should work to resolve these historical issues instead of letting outsiders manipulate them. Initially, my thoughts were very simple and naive, just based on my reading of history. In addition, my father's family has been in Taiwan for nearly a few hundred years, dating back to the end of the Ming Dynasty. We are considered locals in Taiwan, so the idea of nostalgia for Chinese mainland is not very realistic for us, as it is too far away. But I think as a Chinese today, our sense of identity may not necessarily come from a sense of nostalgia for the mainland, but rather from the recognition that Taiwan is also a precious island of China. Our culture has always been the culture of the Chinese people. Since I was young, my father would always say to me that we are all Chinese people on both sides of the straits, and we need to figure out how to solve these historical issues for our generation. As a descendant of a family who has been living in Taiwan for hundreds of years, I feel that it is my responsibility to work towards a solution. The year I was born, 1987, was a significant year in history for me because it marked the beginning of people-to-people -people exchanges between Taiwan and the mainland. It was the year when veterans in Taiwan were allowed to visit the mainland to see their families. I think that for my generation, it's time for a new era to begin. We cannot continue to be entangled in political differences or fixed ideas from the past. It's time to move forward. I believe that reunification will eventually be achieved in the future. Within Taiwan, the Democratic Progressive Party, or DPP, and the pro-independence forces believe they can manipulate the younger generation to achieve their goals. However, young people are also capable of reflection. For instance, in this visit to pay homage to the Yellow Emperor, we saw many of our friends who were born in the 1990s and 2000s. They see the mainland differently from the past, especially to those who were born in the 2000s. They realize that the mainland has undergone significant changes and is now the world's second largest economy. This realization is a significant turning point for them. So in the past, the DPP manipulated young people by tapping into their dissatisfaction with the current reality in Taiwan, and the economy reached a bottleneck. Many young people felt discontent and uncertain about the future. The DPP then directed this dissatisfaction towards the mainland, which is a contradictory and inverted approach. In fact, to break through Taiwan's economic difficulties, it is precisely the vast market in the Chinese mainland that can be relied upon. Therefore, by explaining this principle clearly, we can debunk their argument of using dissatisfaction with the current reality in Taiwan to direct it towards the mainland. This is a flawed reasoning. In fact, due to Taiwan's economic difficulties, we should focus on resolving the political divide across the Taiwan Straits so that we can work together towards common development and rejuvenation. I think you've hit the nail on the head. Actually, there are a lot of young people around us, not just one or two, who are already thinking that in the past they were told that we had to confront the mainland for Taiwan's economy to thrive. But the result is the opposite. Because of provocative actions, Taiwan's opportunity to quickly move towards the world through the mainland was killed. However, it's hard for these young people's voices to be heard in Taiwan's mainstream media. But behind it all, you realize that no matter how you look at it, it's the same logic. Telling you that the two sides must be in opposition, it's just the same. Because I feel that behind it all, there's the power of capital, the power of American capitalism. They actually control the bosses behind these media outlets and manipulate those in Taiwan who don't want change because they are already beneficiaries on the island. They hold the capital and political power on the island. But for ordinary people like us, we need change, because if we don't, Taiwan will become stagnant. We can say that in over 30 years since I was born in Taiwan, there hasn't been much development or modernization. 
job opportunities are decreasing, wages are not increasing, and the path to globalization is becoming narrower. However, Taiwan has a lot of talented people, and many young friends from Taiwan have great ideas, especially in the cultural and creative industries. But we need space to develop. In my opinion, the best path for Taiwan is to be a happy and vibrant island in the Chinese world, in the Chinese nation. Taiwan is a place where people live happily, and many call it a little but solid happiness. I think there's nothing wrong with that. People just want to live a happy, peaceful and stable life. Who wants war? Therefore, we should make Taiwan a place where all Chinese people can come here to travel, go for vacation and relax, and Taiwan's young people can also develop in the whole mainland market. That is the right path. What's the purpose of democracy? It should be summed up as the characters we saw today when we visited Yan'an, serving the people. If democracy truly serves the people, it can bring peace and happiness to the people and bring economic prosperity and well-being to the people. This is what democracy should be. Elections in Taiwan have become a superficial thing, and many people are wondering why Taiwan has elections every year. You have nothing to do? What do people talk about in elections? Political views for the benefit of the people? No. Having elections in Taiwan have ended up focusing on smearing each other, political rivalry, and animosity, which often leads to polarization and tearing society apart. It's a bit like the entertainment industry's talent shows, where it's all about media hype, showmanship and commercial advertising. Everyone rushes to pick their favorite contestant, but once they're elected, they just keep bickering and you can't hold them accountable. I believe that true democracy is not just about a certain form or a noisy and contentious process. True democracy should ultimately be about allowing the people to live a good life. Therefore, if there is reconciliation and peaceful reunification across the Taiwan Straits, we can achieve it through the one country, two systems model, where Taiwan can retain its own system, which it has developed over the years. However, we can unify in terms of national defense, diplomacy and economic strategy. This way, we will not be divided and our strengths can be united for the betterment of the people. We will no longer have to deal with the constant polarization and debates about unification or independence that have lasted for 30 years without any resolution. From the time I was born until now, how many elections have we held? Yet the same issues are being debated. Why is it that none of the candidates have truly focused on the future of Taiwan? Instead, all they think about is how to create a hot topic to gain votes in the upcoming election. Meanwhile, the people continue to suffer. I don't believe this is true democracy. Let me start by sharing some background on my family. This is related to my family history, as my great-grandfather was a member of the Communist Party in Taiwan and also an underground member of the Communist Party of China in Taiwan. During the White Terror period, he was executed by the Chiang Kai-shek regime, and my family avoided talking about this for a long time. It was only in recent years that I slowly learned about this part of my family history. Therefore, despite the fact that Taiwan had already started to desinicize when I was born in 1990, with the emphasis on the history of Taiwan rather than Chinese history, I was fortunate that my parents were both teachers and their school still had a lot of books on Chinese history and geography. This left a deep impression on me and I grew up with a strong sense of my Chinese identity. Later on, as I grew up, I became curious about Mao Zedong and his books, which I saw in my grandfather's collections. In Taiwan, Mao and the history of the People's Republic of China are often demonized in anti-communist propaganda and even by supporters of independence. However, in my family and among many others in Taiwan, there was a sense of admiration for Mao 
and his legacy, which intrigued me and made me want to understand more about it. Later on, I learned from my mother that my family had such a background that deeply influenced my understanding of Chinese people since I was young. As I grew older and learned more about history, I became even more curious about the truth beyond the erasure, demonization and distortion of history in Taiwan. By chance, I received this badge, and since I happened to be in the sacred land of revolution, I wanted to wear it as a sign of my respect. However, due to Taiwan's unique history and the current situation, I am not qualified to wear it as a party member. Nonetheless, I still hope to wear it as a symbol of my admiration. I think the biggest reason is the impact of the Chinese civil war after the retrocession of Taiwan, coupled with the intervention of the United States since the Korean War, when the Seventh Fleet was sent to interfere with the cross strait situation. For over 70 years, Taiwan has been deeply affected. The first generation were patriotic and loved Taiwan and China as a whole. Due to the incompetence of the Chiang Kai-shek regime, many of them believed in a red China. Unfortunately, following the US interference, the Chiang Kai-shek regime took root in Taiwan and launched the White Terror. Many patriots were victims of the White Terror and were eventually swept up in the purge, including my great-grandfather. Some were lucky to be released, and they had already lost a great deal of time and spent their youth behind bars. For example, Lin Shuyang, one of the founders of Taiwan's Labour Party, spent 34 years in prison, which means he spent his entire youth behind bars. During the 34 years of martial law in Taiwan, the voices of these patriots could not be heard. The general public only had access to two kinds of voices. One was the anti-communist education of the Kuomintang, and the other was the so-called concept of freedom and democracy shaped by the United States. People had no way of knowing the real image of the People's Republic of China. I think, especially when I was born, the combination of anti-communism, Taiwan independence and American ideology has created an extremely anti-China and anti-communist image in Taiwan. I'll give you an obvious example. Some people in Taiwan said that people in the mainland cannot afford tea eggs. And they also accused the government of corruption and bribery. They even criticized the high-speed rail system on the mainland. As recently Mr. Ma ying took the high-speed rail with 350 km per hour, they claim that it is intentionally designed. They also have said a long time ago that the high-speed train is too fast for people to catch up with. These ridiculous claims have been circulating in Taiwan since the 1950s and have become deeply ingrained in the society. Is this what they call freedom and democracy? I think freedom and democracy should be built on the three principles of the people, as advocated by Sun Yat-sen. The first thing should be to recognize that the people of Taiwan are Chinese. However, the authorities in Taiwan and the theories constructed by the U.S. are based on the idea of splitting Taiwan from China. In recent years, the people of Taiwan have slowly realized that this situation is not right. Since Taiwan's second term, the U.S. has been arming Taiwan and pushing the people towards the battlefield. Yes, there are even hearsay that even the female may have to serve in the military, and it's even more dangerous that Taiwan's most valuable company, TSMC, 
is slowly being moved to the United States. Chairman Mao once sarcastically said that the United States is a patronizing teacher. I think now the people in Taiwan also realize this. People are starting to see that Taiwan independence is really a dead end, a path that will force people to go to the battlefield and become casualty. And then the US just wants to take all the remaining value from Taiwan and then wave goodbye as you all kill each other and they'll just pat their butts, pretend nothing happened and even use it as an excuse to criticize the Chinese government and so on. For people on both sides of the Taiwan Straits, peace should be the top priority and American interference should be excluded. In my opinion, the so-called freedom and democracy that you just mentioned are actually theories that serve the United States' sole hegemony after the Cold War. These theories are actually serving themselves, even not necessarily the American people, but possibly only the Wall Street groups, capital groups and military-industrial complex. In the past 30 years since the Cold War ended, we've actually seen the wealth gap between the rich and poor around the world grow larger and even more conflicts arise. The problem of peace and development that Deng Xiaoping talked about still hasn't been solved, and it's only gotten worse under Americans' unilateral approach. I think the people of Taiwan should wake up after seeing the persecution by the US. They should also understand the goodwill from the mainland and seize the opportunity of for peaceful reunification, because the US will only close this window. It's something that the people of Taiwan should be aware of. Making sense of the overwhelming wave of information means cutting through the noise to shine a light on the heart of the story and making room for new perspectives. True understanding means the ability to see events from more than one side. I'm Liu Xin, and this is The Point. Uh, I think so-called uh, liberty or freedom means uh, we should uh, respect uh, different countries, uh, have different systems, have different political systems, or uh, we say uh, social system. Uh, I think uh, the real uh, liberty or democracy should be based on uh, respecting uh, sovereignty. Uh, every country has their uh, sovereignty. China is uh, one of the most important uh, great uh, powers, great countries in the world. So today, Chinese people have develop, developed our own uh, system and keep following our road to achieve our goal. This goal uh, is Chinese people can have our own um, freedom, our own sovereignty, our own uh, development. And Taiwan question should be based on Chinese peaceful uh, resolution. Uh, I think uh, Chinese people have our own wisdom to resolve this historic uh, problem uh, on our own ability. So um, we say two systems, but one state. Um, this role, I think, is the best role to resolve uh, this historic problem. Do you? Worry? Do you worry that mm. there may be war at the Strait? Because a mm. lot of people are asking, "Will there be war? Mm, mm, Will mm, there mm. be war?" Do mm. you, are you worried about that? Mm, yes, I I'm worrying about that because uh, American um, inter interference. Uh, because uh, I think today the United States they do not really um, concern about Taiwan's uh, interest or we say 
people's um, safety. Because I think America, uh, the government of the United States, only care about their own interest, uh, especially those politicians or uh, military um, estate, military uh, companies. They care about how to use uh, Taiwan issue um, to um, combat with Chinese mainland. Mm -hmm. But um, mm -hmm. Chinese people, we are peaceful people. We concern about um, world peace, especially uh, peace of Taiwan Strait. So if the United States can respect Chinese people's sovereignty, can respect Taiwan problem should be resolved by the Chinese themselves, I think war can be avoided. Finally, finally, may I ask you to give your comment on Tsai Ing-wen mm -hmm. as a leader? Because mm. right now, as we are speaking, mm. she is d doing all kinds of things as, mm. you know, uh, that is highly criticized by yeah. many people on the mainland as well as on the, on the, on the island. What is your comment on her, on her policies and her behavior? Mm. Uh, I think uh, Ms. Tsai uh, has said uh, she supports so-called um, keeping the status quo. Uh, but how to keep the status quo? We need to, um, we need to uh, develop a uh, cross-strait policy based on uh, 1992 consensus. Because the 1992 so consensus... there's only one China that yeah, can have different interpretations. Yes, it. yes. And uh, although... Uh, Today's uh, Taiwan and Chinese mainland uh, have different systems, but we have uh, the same goal. Uh, that is um, keeping uh, struggling uh, to achieve uh, peaceful, uh, we say, uh, peaceful uh, combined combination with two sides. I think the 1992 consensus can resolve uh, many problems, and that's the only way to keep the status quo. I think Ms. Tai, uh, she knows that. She, uh, she knows that very well, but she devoid uh, because she wants to achieve her own interest. Yeah. What is her own interest? Her own political interest is to uh, achieve uh, so-called the victory of the election by enhancing uh, the dangerous situation of the two sides of Taiwan uh, Strait. That's her. Uh, that's her. That's her political interest. Yeah, but um, on the side of people, we want we want to achieve uh, the peaceful uh, situation. We want to keep that state the status quo. And that the status quo uh, is the best way to Taiwanese people. And also because Taiwan's economy should be based on uh, mainland, uh, Chinese mainland's um, market. Yeah. With that, we come to the end of this special edition of The Point with me, Li Xin, coming to you from Yang'an, a sacred place for Chinese revolution in northwest China's Shanxi province. As always, you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle Li Xin in Beijing. On behalf of the whole team, thank you for watching. You've got The Point.